The New Orleans slave market facilitated the migration of millions of slaves from Upper South states, like Virginia and Maryland, to the Deep South's cotton plantations. In the 1830s, New Orleans had the largest slave market in the United States. New Orleans was also one of the wealthiest cities in the nation due to the cotton business and its slave market. The United States was the world's leading exporter of cotton and a global economic leader second only to England. A lot of the cotton that was produced in the Deep South passed through New Orleans. Due to the removal of Native Americans from their land, millions of acres of land was now available for cotton production. The invention of the cotton gin meant that cotton could be produced faster and more efficiently. Nonetheless, the Deep South still needed millions of slaves to meet the world's growing demand for cotton. Franklin and Armfield, a major slave trading firm, transported 1,000 to 1,500 slaves to New Orleans to be auctioned annually. Most slaves were imported from Upper South states, such as Virginia and Maryland whose primary export was slaves. They arrived in New Orleans by foot and by boat. Those who arrived by foot traveled 1,000 miles over land chained together in what was called a coffle. The trip took several months. Those who arrived by boat were closely packed together and chained for weeks during their long sea voyage from the Chesapeake Bay to New Orleans. The reason for the long journey by foot or by boat was supply and demand. In New Orleans, planters might pay up to $1,200 for slaves that slave traders purchased for $400 or less in Virginia. In New Orleans, there were slave pens throughout the city where slave traders could put their slaves on display prior to the actual auction. The slave pens were an opportunity for slave traders to generate sales in advance of the auction. Slave pens were yards surrounded by high walls. Slave traders had men, women and children line up inside the pens so that they could be inspected by potential buyers. Slave traders hired doctors to make sure that their slaves were in good health. Six slaves were separated from the others to prevent the spread of disease. Slaves had makeup applied to their faces and they were dressed up in fancy clothes to make them appear healthy and presentable. Potential buyers could inspect slaves prior to the auction. They could ask a slave personal questions. They could ask a slave to open his or her mouth in order to examine their teeth and gums. They could feel and examine a slave's genitals and buttock. They could tell a slave to remove their clothing and closely examine their skin. And they could tell a slave to perform an action such as run or jump to measure their fitness. Prior to these inspections, slave traders, like Isaac Franklin, instructed their slaves to be pleasant and cooperative and to hide or lie about any weaknesses. Franklin and Armfield sought the maximum price for each slave. A skinny slave would have been fattened up before the auction. A slave with gray hair would have their hair dyed to look younger. A slave with scars would have those scars covered with wax to appear less visible. Life in the custody of a slave trader was not pleasant. Slaves were exposed to sexual and physical violence and overall poor living conditions. As a result, many slaves were eager to be sold. It was common for slaves to make an effort to sell themselves to prospective buyers. If a slave was not sold at auction, it could take weeks or months to sell that particular slave. Sometimes slaves were given a pass so that they could walk around New Orleans in an attempt to find potential buyers. Slaves needed a pass since any white person could have them arrested if they were asked to present their pass and failed to do so. A family of slaves may find a potential buyer willing to keep the family intact. New Orleans was also the nation's largest market for fancy girls. Fancy girls were young light-skinned, mixed-race, female slaves. White men, in general, preferred these light-skinned female slaves over darker-skinned female slaves as targets for their sexual predation. Light-skinned female slaves were targeted for rape. Slave traders determined who would be a fancy girl based solely on a female slave's attractiveness and skin color. Most fancy girls were teenagers and like most slaves illiterate. A light-skinned female slave had no say in whether or not she would become a fancy girl. It was a business decision that was made by the slave trader alone. A light-skinned female slave was likely the product of a rape. According to the slave laws in southern states, slaves were the property of their owners. Slave laws allowed slave owners to rape their female slaves at will.
As a piece of property who could be beaten, mutilated, or killed at any time, female slaves lack the capacity to consent to intercourse of their own free will. Female slaves produced mixed-race children when they were raped by their white owners, the white friends and family members of the owners, or the white overseers. Slave laws dictated that the child of a slave mother was a slave for life. The slave owner could sell his child to a slave trader if he wished to do so. That slave trader could then sell this light-skinned, mixed-race, female slave as a fancy girl at an auction in New Orleans. It was customary for slave traders to rape and physically abuse fancy girls prior to the auction. Fancy girls were also on display at the New Orleans slave pens prior to the auction. They would be well-dressed and coiffed, and sometimes wear jewelry. A fancy girl could be a status symbol for wealthy men, such as traders, gamblers, or saloon keepers. However, in New Orleans and southern states, any woman who was proven to have one drop of Negro blood could not marry a white man, and any children fathered by a white man would be illegitimate. This applied even if the woman appeared to be white. That meant that the purchaser of a mixed race, fancy girl could rape her at will and father children. Nonetheless, the new owner had no legal obligations to the fancy girl or any children he fathered with her. The new owner could sell the children he fathered with the fancy girl to a slave trader. The most a fancy girl could expect to become was her owner's mistress. Fancy girls were sold explicitly for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Slave traders, like Isaac Franklin and John Armfield sought light-skinned female slaves for their own sexual gratification. They joked about raping these women. They knew that their customers also desired light-skinned female slaves. Since marriage was not an option, these female slaves were bound to become prostitutes or concubines. A fancy girl might become a planter's mistress, a prostitute in a New Orleans bordello, or a barmaid on a riverboat. Fancy girls were the most expensive category of female slave. They sold for four to five times more than a female field laborer. Sometimes they sold for as much or more than a prime male field laborer. For example, a fancy girl might sell for $1,500 or $30,000 in today's dollars. The purchase of slaves could be financed through Louisiana banks, such as the Bank of Orleans Union Bank of Louisiana, Canal Bank, and Citizens Bank. The slave would be the collateral for the loan. The purchase of slaves could also be financed through the Second Bank of the United States, which was located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The bank had 25 branches including a New Orleans branch. Franklin and Armfield, the nation's largest slave trader, sold its slaves to buyers in New Orleans on credit. In 1830, New Orleans had five banks, but four years later, it had 12 banks that competed to underwrite expanding markets in land, cotton, sugar, and slaves. Slave owners viewed their slaves' children as capital. For slave owners, fathering children with a female slave could be purely a business decision. And banks accepted slave children as collateral for new loans. Therefore, a slave owner could use his existing slaves as collateral for a loan to purchase new slaves.